travel in the Star Trek universe is more dangerous and interesting than you know. With that in mind, I'm Sean Farrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 things you need to know about Warp Drive. Number 10. Humans were very late to the game. Everybody knows that humanity achieved their first independent warp flight on April 5th, 2063. On this day, Zephram Cochran piloted the Phoenix, the ship that he created from the shell of a nuclear missile, breaking the light speed barrier for the first time. This attracted attention, widening humanity's view of the universe. The Vulcan survey ship to plan a hath was passing through the Sol system and was alerted to the flight. They made first contact with Earth, beginning the process that would eventually lead to the formation of the Federation. For the Vulcans, however, this achievement came almost three millennia after they had broken the light speed barrier themselves. Themselves. It was roughly the 9th century BC Earth Reckoning when the Vulcans achieved warp drive. However, according to Ronald D. Moore, Cochrane is still credited as inventing warp drive as it is understood in the Star Trek universe. This could mean that the Vulcans had been using a less sophisticated form of propulsion, similar to the Romulan method of forced quantum singularities, that was then abandoned after meeting with Cochrane in the 21st century. Number 9. The Phoenix wasn't always humanity's first warp ship. Although accepted canon now has the Phoenix as the first human warp capable ship, this wasn't always the case. Star Trek Deep Space Nine had a model of the Bonaventure C221 in Keiko O'Brien's schoolroom appearing in two episodes. It was a cylindrical vessel shown once in a diagram and a second time as a physical model. According to its designer Doug Drexler, it was a forerunner to the Bonaventure NCC 10281 that had previously appeared in the animated series episode The Time Trap. In fact, the Bonaventure was the name of the first warp ship long before the Phoenix was ever conceived. In the novel Federation by Judith and Garfield Reese Stevens, Zephram Cochran travelled to Alpha Centauri aboard the Bonaventure, with his later personal vessel being named the Bonaventure 2. At the time of release in 1994, this still remained in canon with the TV series, as Star Trek First Contact was not released until 1996. Number 8. Don't mess with the antimatter containment pods. Warp drive, at least aboard a Federation starship, was achieved by the controlled release of matter and antimatter via the warp core. However, if the two substances were ever to meet, they would destroy each other, releasing a wave of pure energy, most often referred to as a warp core breach. A breach invariably resulted in the destruction of whatever ship it occurred on. The USS Yamato fell victim to an Iconian probe that drained power from the antimatter containment pods. Once energy levels fell below 15%, they failed, resulting in the antimatter escaping containment and destroying the ship. The Enterprise D almost succumbed to the same fate, though Captain Picard and Commander Data were able to prevent it in time. They only bought the ship a few years though. Battle with a Klingon bird of prey commanded by the Duras sisters resulted in catastrophic damage to the antimatter containment units and the coolant systems. Though the crew managed to escape to the saucer section, which separated, the drive section was consumed by the breach, with the resulting shockwave crashing the saucer into the surface of Iridian 3. Number 7. Antimatter does a lot more than make ships go. Warp drive is powered by antimatter and matter, however, antimatter is far more durable than simply serving as one half of futuristic diesel. In fact, it has been shown to have a strange relationship with standard space-time. In the original series episode The Naked Time, the ship is able to travel backward through time using controlled implosions of antimatter. While this, of course, is a very handy trick for getting out of a tight spot, it is rarely referred to again. The Enterprise does travel through time via warp drive several more times, though without using this method. In the Next Generation episode, we'll always have power antimatter served in the opposite role. Data had to use antimatter to realign one of Dr. Paul Mannheim's experiments as it had begun to deteriorate, resulting in disruptions in space-time. Here, antimatter actually set the flow of time to rights again. It has other uses outside of propulsion as well, including being a component of photon torpedoes. Had the Enterprise B been carrying a complement of photons during its maiden voyage, they would have been able to detonate an antimatter explosion near enough to the SS Lacoule and SS Robert Fox freeing them from the Nexus. However, the torpedoes didn't arrive till Tuesday. Number 6. Those Ample Nacelles most vessels stick to a standard two nacelle design. These nacelles, taking their name from the similar propulsion components on air and watercraft, created a subspace distortion field around the ship, allowing vessels to ride through the distortion at extreme velocities. They were usually separated from the rest of the ship by large pylons, an idea stemming from Matt Jeffries, the designer of the original Enterprise. He felt that, when in use, the nacelles would be flooded with dangerous levels of radiation and that no crew member should be near them. This rule was relaxed by the seventh season of The Next Generation, 
building as a control room was built into them. Later ships like the Defiant and Steamrunner class had the nacelles built directly into the main hull. These nacelles were still a weak point on their ships. Damage could be catastrophic, such as an alternate timeline that saw the Enterprise D explode following a collision with the USS Bozeman. By the 31st century, Starfleet had begun to design ships with detached nacelles. While this was said to make warp drive in these vessels more reliable, it also served to protect the ships from direct damage due to impact with the nacelles. Several ships, including the Freedom class, Hermes class, Saladin class, and in the alternate timeline, Kelvin class, were also able to operate with only one warp nacelle. Number 5. One Crystal to Rule Them All Dilithium crystals were the main source of powering the warp cores of Starfleet ships, along with many other races in the galaxy. The Klingons, Cardassians and the Breen all sought these rare minerals for their propulsion systems, and much like the fossil fuel crisis that Earth faces today, these were a finite resource, leading to raiding parties and trouble between powers. By the 2250s, Starfleet was already aware of the dwindling supplies, though it would not become acutely critical until the 31st century. Experiments in spore drive technology were initiated in the hope of replacing the crystals, though they were deemed a failure. Another issue facing them was that through a process known as decrystallization, they would effectively run out of power. Spock and Scotty managed to devise a way to recharge them during a temporal mission in 2286, which was then implemented through the rest of the fleet by the 24th century. The discovery of a planet made of dilithium in the Verubian Nebula may have served to help Starfleet get back on its feet by the 32nd century, though many more experiments in alternative forms of travel were badly needed to replace this already dwindling supply. Number 4. Warp 10 in the original series at the time of the Enterprise's famous five-year mission, the galaxy operated on a different warp scale to that which was used in the next generation onward. For example, it was possible for ships to travel in excess of warp 10 without occupying every point in the universe instantaneously, though it was still considered an unsafe velocity. The Orions routinely travelled at these speeds as, according to Spock at least, they were unconcerned with safety. Modifications to the Enterprise allowed it to travel in excess of the speed as well, including the changes made by the Nomad probe and by the Kelvins. Perhaps the greatest sustained velocity observed by the Enterprise at this time was that of Carla 5 in the counterclock incident. Thanks to the extreme time dilation effects of a black hole and her own natural reversed universe, her vessel was recorded travelling at warp 36, a speed that was theoretically impossible at the time. Generally, starships kept their speed below the warp 10 barriers for the safety of ship and crew, though they were, at that time, capable of breaking this speed limit. Number 3. Salamander Speed in the 24th century, the Warp 10 barrier was redesignated to become infinite velocity, which meant that, in theory, no ship should be able to break this barrier. This was tested on a number of occasions. First, the Enterprise D travelled at speeds that neared Warp 10 when both the Traveller and Kaczynski came aboard the ship. The Traveller's modifications allowed the ship to reach Galaxy M33. Commander Riker and Captain Picard theorised that breaking the Warp 10 barrier would allow a ship to travel back in time, which, according to them, was how the shuttlecraft El Baz had managed such a the following year. The most significant experiment on reaching warp 10 occurred in the Delta Quadrant. Thanks to the discovery of an extremely rare form of dilithium, Torres and Paris were able to fit the shuttlecraft Cochrane with a warp 10 coil. The experiment was a success with a sting in the tail. While Paris did break the barrier, he then underwent a hyper-evolution which saw him evolve into a giant salamander. Before reaching his final form, he kidnapped Captain Janeway, taking her on a warp 10 flight. The experiment was deemed too risky to repeat, even though both officers were returned to their normal forms. Number 2. The Great Experiment In the 2280s, Starfleet had begun a series of experiments that began with the USS Excelsior NX-2000. This ship, said to have transwarp capabilities, was captained by Stiles, a deeply arrogant commander who stepped over Sulu for promotion. He received a nasty shock when the Excelsior suffered a total system shutdown after Scotty sabotaged their propulsion systems. Though little was said of the transwarp experiment again, it was said that these trials were deemed a failure. The Excelsior was retrofitted with a conventional warp drive entering service later that decade. Starfleet would not manage to achieve transwarp until the 2370s. However, perhaps failure is too strong a word, as the discoveries made while testing the Excelsior led directly to the upgrading of their engines and the advanced propulsion systems on board the Ambassador class ships. Both classes of vessels remained in service well into the 24th century, thanks primarily to their durability in action. In fact, both were seen as strong enough to bear the name Enterprise. A refit of the Excelsior class became the Enterprise B, while an Ambassador class ship became the Enterprise C. Number 1. Transwarp, Slipstream and Beyond 
There are, of course, other forms of transport in the Star Trek universe. The Borg have managed to successfully achieve transwarp capability, which allows them to suddenly appear at the drop of a hat. Their system of transwarp corridors, linked by hubs dotted throughout the galaxy, has greatly contributed to their terrifying reputation. They primarily use transwarp coils and a chroniton field to achieve these speeds, as the gravimetric shear that a cube creates could, in theory, tear it to pieces. While Federation ships can use transwarp coils, finding them was extremely difficult as the Borg were not known for their generosity. An alternative appeared in the form of a quantum slipstream drive aboard the USS Dauntless, though this too turned out to be too dangerous. This was supplied by an alien named Arturus, and he was hell-bent on delivering Voyager to the Borg. Slipstream drive relied on Benamite crystals as opposed to dilithium. These were even rarer to find, though a small supply was secured the year after first discovering the Dauntless. While Voyager was only able to shave 10 years off their journey this way, by the 32nd century, it was a standard system aboard ships such as books. That's everything for our list today, guys. If you reckon I missed anything, please let us know in the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Every time that you smash that like or subscribe button, you are directly helping this channel grow and you're helping us bring the best content to you on a weekly basis. You can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on all the socials as well. Until I'm talking to you again, look after yourself. You're awesome and live long and prosper.